Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Integrate Your Microfocus IT Operations into a Single Pane of Glass 4D Solution. Next slide. So today's webinar is brought to you by Edge Technologies. And I will be your host today. Uh, my name is Saeed Hussein. Um, I'm the Vivid DevOps Special Interest Group co-leader and principal architect at Adarsa Services based out of Washington, D.C. metro area. We specialize in application delivery management with focus on quality and automation. The solutions we design and implement help our clients accelerate time to market without compromising security and quality. Next slide. Today we have a special speaker. Um, name is Ed Wilhide. Ed is one of the co-founders of Edge Technologies and now serves as CTO. In this role, Ed oversees the implementation and development of Edge's products and service strategies, translating the needs of our customers and the market into Edge innovations. Um, during his time with Edge and in prior roles, Ed has managed the launch of multiple successful commercial products used worldwide. His experience and background span multiple disciplines, including software engineering, network operations, threat intelligence, and cyber situational awareness. Ed served as National Security Telecommunications Advisory Committee member. Next slide. Some um, housekeeping rules. Um, today's live session is intended for all Divid members. The on-demand recording slide deck and questions and answers will be posted on the Vivid website, visible for all members. Additionally, today's slide deck, questions and answers, and on-demand uh, recording will be available to you. We'll send you a link via email once they are posted to the Vivid website. If you have questions as we go along, please type and send them in using the questions pane in the webinar control panel, shown on the next slide. Shown here is a picture of the GoToWebinar control panel that usually appears in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. To submit a question, make sure the questions pane is expanded and type in your question and then click on send. So let's get started. I'll pass it over to Ed. Thank you, Saeed, and good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, this is Ed Wilhite from Edge Technologies, and as Saeed mentioned, I'm the co-founder and chief technology officer for Edge. Uh, and I'm really excited about the prospect of speaking with you today about the Edge Suite product and how we work and work with the micro focus suite of excuse me, micro focus suite of tools. Uh, how do you sense make sense of your data? This is a common question that we're always asking ourselves, and it's expanded greatly beyond this since we originally uh, brought the product to market. It's expanded into how do we make sense of our products, our multitude of tools, resources, and different uh, different verticals that we work through, even internally in our own organizations. So next slide, please. Standard disclaimer, uh, we're going to be talking about forward-looking statements here. So this is, we do our best to, to maintain our schedules and delivery <clears throat> plan. Uh, but these things do change. Next slide. Okay, Edge Technologies, we're a data integration and software visualization company. Uh, we serve the global clients, telecommunications, uh, enterprise, uh, managed service providers. Uh, the, the real, one of the real strengths of our product and the approach that we take is the rapid integration with which we can incorporate and integrate different applications, uh, diverse sets between vendors and silos into a single pane of glass. And I'll be showing you that today. Uh, they're deployed ac across global infrastructures. Uh, we have a number of large-scale service providers that we're working with, and they're providing internet-facing views of these tools and our systems that are typically restricted to internal environments. And Embedded in the product, we've got a number of different patents that are centered around how we integrate with different tools and systems, specifically on the web integration side, which we'll be getting to a little bit later. It's one of the key differentiators of the product and the market between what are traditional BI and visualization tools. We have over 150 pre-built integrations into a variety of different platforms and products uh, that span OSS, automation, BI, performance. We're really serving as a one-stop shop for enterprises and their customers uh, for all information relative to IT operations, security, and automation. Next slide. So getting down to the details, I'm going to be moving through these pretty quickly because I really would like to get into demo. I'm going to be illustrating a number of these different points to you. 
Uh, the first one is that we're presenting a single pane of glass for our customers to a variety of different network operations, security operations, OSS, business operations, uh, into, as I mentioned, a single pane of glass. And what's really, at least in my experience, people have been trying to solve this problem for probably about the last 20 years. And throughout that time, I've seen multiple companies try to take a pass at it. I think we have a very unique approach to it in that we're looking at integrating it both the data side and the web side. And that really provides, that fine balance really provides our customers with a means to really recognize, or sorry, realize um, a single pane of glass as they envisioned it 20 years ago and today. Part of it, you know, very key to the single pane of glass is single sign-on. We provide uh, a number of different mechanisms to support single sign-on, both to applications that are currently uh, integrated with some of the single sign-on infrastructures and those that aren't. So we're acting as an enabler for those that aren't to plug into some of the more modern infrastructures. The system is role-based. And what that means to us is that stakeholders within an organization, you have a, a variety of them. They're both technical, managerial, executive, and they all have a different need for the information that's, um, you know, information relating to IT operations and their business services. And one of the themes that you'll see throughout this presentation or demo is simplification. When we're in an enterprise environment and they've got two, do two dozen different systems that are involved in monitoring, maintaining, uh, various enterprise services or customer delivered managed services it's it's that simplification that is key to providing the visibility that people are looking for into these tools and applications role based also means they have access to write back controls as well so the product as i mentioned before we're we're a data integration and visualization platform but we do provide an, an, an avenue for action to be taken against that data and information. And I'll go through that a little bit later. Consolidation uh, is key, not only both uh, from, an, from an organizational perspective where you've got a combination of different acquisitions that have different mechanisms for, for their management and IT operation systems, um, but also just internally as well, between product suites and between product vendors. We act as that visualization layer for them. Increased efficiencies through that consolidation, for, uh, produces a reduced OPEX. So we're, you know, we're, we're providing that single pane of glass, as I mentioned. And I think you'll see as we get into this, just the power of the capability that we're bringing to bear to realize that. Next slide. So Edge Suite. Edge Suite is our product. Uh, it is the industry's only secure vendor neutral integration platform for providing rapid deployment integration and time to value. And there's a couple of different areas that I just wanted to mention before we get into the demo as well, that we, that we provide. One of them is we are an HTML5 web application. We're built from the ground up on internet and cloud technologies. So we're, we're ready for multiple devices, uh, you know, your phones, your, your tablets, your desktops, and we'll get into that in a minute. But our, our layout is automatic, uh, adaptive, and responsive. Single sign-on, role-based, uh, it's an inheritance model. We, we have a model in place that allows you to provide single sign-on to your different applications in a secure way um, and make it role-based as well. So different people have different levels of access and different authentication tokens into the different systems. Uh, our web integration, we have a number of pre-built libraries, as I mentioned earlier, that allow you to very quickly connect to these different applications and systems and bring them into our single pane of glass. On the data side, APIs, this is more traditional data integration ETL. We call it ETV. Extract, transform, transform, and visualize. We'll show you some examples of that. Correlation. This is one of the keys to the product that I think you'll find very interesting as we get into the demo, and that's the ability to join and pull together multiple data sources uh, and transform them so that you can provide much more contextual views, tailored views of the information and data that people are looking for uh, in today's environments. Scale, the product is highly scalable. And when I say it's scalable, I mean it from two different perspectives. We have a global scalability model, clustering, um, you know, horizontal scaling of our systems and platforms, but also scalability from the perspective of when we're connecting to, to typical IT operations tools, they were never intended to support thousands of simultaneous users getting information and data from them. Uh, if we went directly to those tools, we would essentially degrade them because we'd be putting so much of a load on them from the user perspective. With our model, we're able to make 
a limited number of requests of these products and tools and then scale them out greatly. Um, and that's at a service provider grade where they've got a number of thousands of companies, thousands of users that are accessing this system. And that's, I just wanted to mention that from the scalability perspective because it is, it is very important to our customers. Branding, uh, this is especially important for our managed service providers. It is fully brandable, so you can modify, change. There's, there's uh, many different ways to modify the look and feel, both from a CSS perspective, if you want to get into that level, uh, but also from a UI perspective. So we've got that. That's been a very much in need of our managed service community, and it also lends us to branding internally to organizations as well. We have a number of different mechanisms from a compliance perspective for multi-tenant enforcement, and I'll get into that in a little bit as well, uh, but that is also a very powerful feature. We're really oriented towards delivering data to a number of different customers securely in a segmented fashion um, that is in line with the needs of our customers, our service providers, and enterprises. Next slide. This is just a, a quick overview. I just want to, it's a general architecture of how the product works. Uh, on the left, you have your personas. Those are all the stakeholders that need information from their IT and security operations products. Edge Suite has what's called the core. This is really the enterprise framework for authentication, multi-tenancy control, um, user management, look and feel. All of those things are contained in what's called the core. Then you have Edge Web and Edge Data. Edge Data is something you're probably more familiar with. This is us connecting to SOAP APIs, REST APIs, databases data providers uh, that are typical today's environments. The web integration is unique. Our approach to it, I've never seen anywhere else in the industry. We're essentially pulling out pieces. We're connecting to web applications, authenticating them with them seamlessly for the user. Then we're pulling out pieces of those applications to incorporate into our, our dashboards and workflow. It's You'll see as we get into it what kind of power that brings to the table. If you're in an enterprise and you want to provide a single pane of glass, the, you don't have the option to rip and replace everything and you're going to go and just build a new UI for all these different tools and systems. It just doesn't make any sense. You want to maintain your existing investment. And this web integration model really allows you to do that. And from there, on the far right, you've got the different integrations that we, different systems that we speak to. This, this list could be 100 as far as I'm concerned. There's a really broad diversity of things that we communicate with and talk to. And uh, those reflect the needs of our customers. Next slide. As I mentioned before, we're a web-based HTML5 application. Uh, for those of you that are more technical, it's an Angular infrastructure that we're working with on the client. And we're using a, a fully adaptive model for the layout. So the UI will essentially adapt to whatever device you're looking at and uh, screen real estate that you have. No plugin, there's no app downloaded. Uh, it works universally across browsers on the different devices. Next slide. This is a quick overview of the, some of the integrations that we have. You'll see some of the micro, the microfocus products up here that we connect with, both the data and the web layer. And then beneath it, just a number of other partner and ecosystem related products that we also connect with and communicate with. Next slide, please. Here's a, a, a sample of some of our customers. You'll notice that they span both the federal and commercial space. And on the commercial side, it's both enterprises, um, service providers, some of the largest service providers in the world, largest banks in the world. We've got a, a, a very solid penetration into those enterprises and those customer, that customer base, and we're just looking to expand it. Next slide. Just a quick overview of kind of where we're seeing the market moving. It's the, you know, invariably with all the, excuse me, all the, uh, all the different customers that we're dealing with, what we're seeing is, as we all are, the move to a combination of an on-premise hybrid and cloud oriented model that they're using and what that's doing is it's it's really increasing the need for a single plane of glass whereas in our market we saw a consolidation of a number of the different products into you know product suites and platforms and that was the unification process as that's changing and evolving customers are incorporating new and different technologies to address it and it's only increasing the need for a single pane of glass into the customers environments so the problem that we've been solving for a number of years is only getting greater and the opportunities to address it are as well. Uh, next slide. Just want to touch on this slide very quickly. This is, a, this is an example of a consolidated microfocus dashboard uh, that incorporates uh, HPNA, NNMI, uh, 
I know we have OMI in there as well. And it's a combination of data and web integration. And if you'll notice up in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see this in the demo, that is a NNMI web integration. So we've got a number of different views here that are presenting not only data individually from those products, but it's providing a combination of them in context. So you'll see nodes from NNMI with uh, ticket-oriented information or change-oriented information. So just wanted to kind of give you that perspective before we move into the demonstration. Next slide. Okay, so moving into the demo. Just bear with us for a moment. Okay. All right. This is Edge Suite. What I'd like to cover with you today I'm going to cover a couple of different topics. I'm going to start off by just giving you an overview of the product, our data integration and visualization strategy, how that relates to our write back strategy to different systems, web integration. I'm going to go through some example uses of how the product is deployed to give you some perspective. And then we're going to follow up with a more of a deep dive technical perspective on how these different things are put together and how they work. So on the, this is an example here of a managed services page for customers based on a combination of NNMI data and ticketing information. This UI is fully brandable. You can have it in a light theme, you can have it in a dark theme, you can have the colors any way you like or the icons any way you like. There's a lot of different ways that this can be tailored to provide the kind of uh, brand look you want to provide to your customers. Each one of these screens is talking to multiple data sources. So for example, here we have a series of NNMI, NNMI, excuse me, NNMI nodes that are also fusing in data from OMI and NA. You'll see we have a combination of the ability to show different icons here, composites. This is all fully configurable depending on the data sources you have that represent different statuses at a glance. The idea is that we want to provide that contextual view, not only of independent systems, but of a combination of them in a way that's meaningful to the end user. So at a glance here, I can take a look at a node, I can see its state, I can see its maintenance state, and I can see its performance state in one view. So just to give you a, a quick perspective on how some of this is pulled together or what's driving it under the covers, I'm gonna go into our edit mode. So this is a builder environment and all these visualizations can be modified or changed or built from scratch from both a UI configuration perspective and we also have hooks for developers who want to write their own visualizations. But our goal of the product is to really reduce the, um, <clears throat> the skill level in a lot of technical areas to, to be to produce these things quickly. And we call it a low code <clears throat> environment that, you know, as a user, we do a lot of the work, hard work for you in terms of transformations and views. And we're giving you the opportunity to think about your systems, think about your data and how you want them presented. So give you some visibility into that. I want to go ahead and take a quick look at an incident view. Any one of these visualizations, I can say I want to edit the visualization, and I want to go into what's called the pipeline. And this pipeline is a really a graphical ETV, as I mentioned before, a series of nodes that show you how data is being collected and passed through the system. Each one of them has their own editors, uh, so you can make, make changes and modifications. But in this case, we've got a single visualization that's reading information from OMI and NMI through their SOAP APIs and an incident management system. OMI is reading, uh, making requests via JSON. NNMI is making it via SOAP and transforming the information via XML and SSLT. Incident management system is JSON as well. So if you think about the data flowing from left to right, from the connection to the end visualization, this is how this flow is performed. Let's give a quick look at some of these here. If I want to establish a connection, I want to go ahead and shrink this up a little bit so we have a little more screen space down here. I can define my, my specific endpoint, but I can also enable failover to define multiple NNMIs that I want to connect to in an enterprise environment. I'm assigning what my endpoint is, and I'm assigning my, my authentication. Uh, in this case, it's basic authentication. The credentials I'm using are inherited by the user. So any user that's connecting into the system will, may or may not have access to the SOAP API from an authentication perspective. 
Uh, and that's the kind of mechanisms we have in place to really provide security against the data set. There's that, and plus we have other mechanisms I'll get into later that really help us provide a very secure multi-tenant framework. If I want to look at my NNMI, this is called a feed. This is where we're making the request. And this is actually the request that's going back to NMI itself. From there, the request is made. We get our XML back. We then use XSLT to go ahead and make the transition, and we see the results. Now, all the data that's being read in from these different feeds is then flattened in so for relational uh, processing. So as you see here, we took an XML hierarchy, we extracted the information that we wanted, and now we've flattened it into a tabular format. And that allows us to do other transformations down the line in SQL or via GUIs or via JavaScript as well. Let me give you a quick look at JSON processing. It's a little bit different from the XML side. If you notice here on the JSON side, we've got our expression that's being sent to the client. And what we've done here is we've incorporated what are called secure variables. Secure variables are really our mechanism to uh, filter data out in a way that the client never has access to or can never see. So it's, it's another level of control that we have in the product to make sure the right data is getting to the right people. Here in this case, we've made our JSON request. We've got our data back. We're going to apply what's called a JSON path. And here we get our results. Here's our hierarchy. We can define what, and what we want to get passed on to the system for flattening, essentially. And we've got what are called exposed values. That really lets us kind of take netted and embedded uh, nested data sets and flatten them effectively. Look at our tabular preview. And here we are with that data set. Looking further down the pipeline, you notice we can apply, we can apply SQL to it. Um, or we can apply a filter transform, which we'll get to a little bit later, which is a GUI-based version of what you're seeing here. But here again, you've got a number of different data sources. You're joining them together and you're getting your result. These are the variables that are being pushed into it, and they're really what's filtering this ultimate this data set that's being uh, produced. So we've got our APIs endpoints. This is from the data side. We've got our requests here in dark blue. We've got our transformations, and we support SQL, JavaScript. We have a GUI filter that performs SQL-like functions. And we also have some very specialized transforms for things like topologies, and flow, which I'll show you later, that really, again, cut down on the level of effort needed uh, to produce these kinds of views. And I'll walk you through a simple example later, and I'll show you really how easy that is. Finally, we're going to get to the incident table. And each one of the visualizations has its own editor. And I'll get into this a little bit later as well, but the idea is that you can, just through GUI configuration, define what you want your visualization to be and ultimately see your preview. Tables are very simple. We have some very complex ones also that we should show you later. Write back. Show you another example of write back in action. And just a little bit about this view. This is a view that a support manager would have. Um, if you look at the bottom here, we've got our list of incidents and tickets. This is what we're all used to seeing in our environments. It's a very flat list. You don't have much context from it. So what we've done with this view is that all the different views that are in this, this page are being driven off the same data set. This view is what's called a flow diagram. And what we've done is we've taken a few of the columns through a transform, related them, and now we can see the volume of tickets or incidents that are being generated by the business services, what groups they're assigned to, the individual user that they're assigned to, and finally their progress. And you can change this any way you like or have any kind of relations that you would like to, to to display. It just provides another way of looking at the information. And we talk about stakeholders wanting to see something specific or get a specific insight out of it. These kind of visualizations are key and they're much more meaningful than your typical charts and graphs that we're all used to, especially tables. From the write back perspective, our product has what are called write back actions or write back connectors. I'm going to show you an example of that right now. I'm going to set the state of one of these tickets to in progress. I select that. Now what happens is there's an action being fired off on the server that's talking back to the API. We get our response back. You see this change to be in progress. And the other UIs, I don't know if you noticed it, but they all reacted, changed their numbers, changed their, their general flow to reflect that change. 
that right back capability is really between that and the web integration, it's a key differentiator to what people consider a BI and visualization products. We are more than a visualization product. We allow you to take action, we provide web integration. This is a real time operations oriented environment and it's very much in a different class from those tools and products. We can do visualizations, we can do things that look very much like those reports, but typically if we're working with a BI tool, we'll just incorporate it into uh, our product as a web integration. So speaking of web integrations, I wanna go ahead and move over to that, show you a quick example of that and how the, the interaction works. So what you see in the top two screens here, these are data requests that we've made back to NMMI. We've asked for the node groups and we've asked for the incidents. Now those are very small, quick uh, requests. They're very lightweight in comparison to the UIs that we're working with. So this, show, this gives you some visibility into the kind of scale you can achieve with uh, data-oriented requests and pairing them up with web visualizations as it makes sense. So here we've got a topology of a specific node group being presented in NNMI, as well as the incident details for an incident from the list. Now, what if you'll notice, when I first brought up this screen, I didn't have to authenticate, I didn't see a login page, it brought me to a specific place in the application. I'm looking at a node group specific to the topology component, but I don't have the other tools and controls around it. Now, I can open up a screen into NMI with single sign-on. I'll show you that. And this would be providing single sign-on, growing into the, to the core NMI interface, where you have all your features and control that you'd like. As part of our product, and one of the methodologies that we were using, is we, we try to pull out we have, we have one of these pages, we have an objective for that page, a certain information to be passed on, or certain actions to be taken, and we, we want to present users with just the information that they need. This is especially important if you have a dozen, two dozen products, and you have teams, especially on the support side, who train them up on a new product or infrastructure, or sorry, infrastructure tool, is a very expensive uh, proposition. What we do is we abstract some of that out. We just present them what they need, it reduces training, it improves our capacity to build workflow and have direct them to different places. Um, as well as, you know, if they're gonna be incorporating other products, uh, we can do, take certain, I guess, uh, essentially try to abstract some of them to, to ease the process of migration and integration of new products and systems. So here, this is a data integration I mentioned, this is a web integration. What's gonna make them interact, and I'm gonna go into my edit mode so you can see this a little bit more here, are what are called page variables. This is one of the mechanisms that we use to have our different products and tools interact. And when I mouse over one of these variables, you'll see the different widgets that are listening for it highlighting, so I know what's gonna be what they're looking for. Um, when I select on a node group here, now this is a data selection, both of these components are listening to these variables, so they both update. On the incident side, I've selected an incident, and that's gonna provide, I guess I'm actually looking at that one. I'm gonna provide a new incident uh, details for you that reflects that. So if you think about the kind of combinations you can have of different tools and systems, data and web together from different product offerings, different parts of the micro-focus suite, you end up with a very powerful combination um, you know, for, for giving people at a high level the information that they're looking for, which is usually on the data side, and then in the detail, the specifics, really unleashing the power of the underlying products in a way that works for them, makes more sense. They don't have to learn those tools necessarily as much as they would have to, but they can get just as much value out of them uh, through this approach. One other quick point, I'll just show you when I mentioned the word actions. Each one of these widgets has what's called an action, uh, an action model. And here we've got a very simple one set. I've got a variety of different actions I can accomplish. Uh, I can create a custom tooltip, and I have a number of different things I can do when I select on a piece of data in one of those visualizations. I can launch a URL, I can launch a server action, I can set a page variable, like you see there on the left, show my record details, show a visualization, switch to a page, which would be the equivalent of a drill down. All of these things can be configured to reflect the workflow that you want to achieve with your products. It's very typical for us to, when we're working with our customers, they find that they're always orienting their workflow uh, around the tools themselves. This gives them 
the power to create a workflow that they want to realize with the tools. And it's it's a it's a bit of a different paradigm, but it's very powerful uh, when we're working in some of these specific enterprises and service providers that have very specific use cases they need to accomplish. Oh, I was getting out the actions. Let me just go into that a little more detail here. So in this case, we said we're going to set a page variable when you click on a piece of data. And these are all those page variables you saw on the right. I'm literally just saying I can set it, unset it. I can set it to a static value or I can use a record value. That's the data that I want to push into that variable from the thing I selected. So in that node group visualization, it's got a couple of different things that can be used to drive it. And I'm just selecting what I want to be, what I want that page variable to be populated with when I click. So if you look at the node group ID here, when I click on this node group, you see a change. And then the, the corresponding forms react. And again, when I, and I talked about some of the other products and visualization tools that we, we, are, we run into very frequently in our environments. This web integration mechanism is how we pull them into the overall product. If there's a specific reporting capability or report that people want integrated, it falls under the umbrella of the single pane of glass and gets incorporated into it that way. Because it's, it's very rare that I've seen that, or I have not seen it to be honest, that a customer can achieve any kind of actionability off of a BI or you know, traditional BI or general visualization product like a Microsoft BI or a Tableau. It's just not what they're made to do. And that's one of the key differentiators that we, we are, uh, we have, and, and one of the reasons why we can bring them under our umbrella. One quick other comment about web integration and something like this view. When we're connecting to NNMI, we're not correct. We're, our product, Edge Suite, is connecting directly to NNMI. The user connects to Edge Suite. So while I don't like to use the word proxy, in that regard, we are proxying that content through Edge Suite. And what that allows us to do is connect to multiple backend tools and systems, multiple web applications, multiple NNMIs, multiple NAs or OMIs, and make them available, especially in a managed service perspective or service provider perspective, through one port in the customer facing environment. The customer only talks to Edge Suite through that one port, Edge Suite communicates to the backend systems uh, directly, which means that the end customer never has credentials to the backend system. Edge Suite is either managing those and does a conversion of their account into another set of credentials, or is you know, querying another system, Active Directory, LDAP, uh, RSA, CAC for our federal customers uh, that provides that kind of access. Uh, and, and it's just another mechanism that we provide from a security perspective for secure delivery of this content. We also have worked with customers who have discovered that there are vulnerabilities in some of these applications um, that they want to have corrected. And through the same proxying technology, which is really our ability to manipulate the content that's coming through it, that's why we can trim out some of these headers and get people directly to the information that they're looking for. Uh, but it's, it's really, uh, we're manipulating the DOM model itself. So we have a lot of control there over what gets sent back. We can actually restrict different parts of the product from ever making it out to the customer. You know, pulling all those things together, it's one of the reasons why you know, we say we are truly a secure portal in this environment today. And we're used by a number of large service providers exactly for that reason. So very quickly before I get to some of the details, I just want to give you a quick overview of some other example uses. I'm going to manage customer now. Let me go back to an enterprise perspective. A very brief overview, but it just will give you some thoughts to think about when I'm getting into some more details here. This is a view, it's reminiscent of one of the accounts we're working with, where they're monitoring a number of enterprise applications. In their case, it's in the hundreds. In this case, we've got 14. But in each case, each one of those applications or services is being monitored by a number of different systems, whether it be event management system, uh, APM, network infrastructure, storage. Uh, in the case of the customer account I'm, I'm referring to, they had a dozen of these. And what they were looking for was a unified view, a very qu quick and at a glance perspective on what the health of that service was from the various systems that were reporting on it, including tickets. Is there a P1 on this system? These questions were all easily answered. And when the different teams were coming together and trying to triage this issue, they immediately had a point of reference with this view that showed them 
what the other monitoring tools and systems were seeing for that application. So when I showed you that Fusion example a little bit earlier, this is a great example of that. These products are diverse. Uh, they're showing different information, but we can unify the perspective they're providing through the single pane of glass model that we're looking at here. Another quick example, this is a regional, well, this is a service provider looking at different regions of the country and trying to get a handle on what the status is. We're pulling in the information, we're pulling through tickets, we're pulling through incidents, we're pulling through asset management or CMDB information, we're getting device counts, we're getting alarm and ticket counts, P1s, and then we're also fusing in geospatial information with those nodes. So that node list I showed you earlier is actually being fused with geospatial information to show these kind of geospatial views. And we're talking to our web environment, this is a live demo by the way, we're talking to our, a live envir our demo environment and that demo environment happens to have quite a number of uh, red devices in it. So that's why you're seeing the sea of red on this visualization, not so much for the other reasons. I have an action here where I can click and drill down. So from here, I'm drilling into more detail. I'm making specific queries to different systems. And I'll show you a little bit of variation in the timelines here, or sorry, the visualizations. This is called a timeline visualization. It shows the same information that we're used to seeing in lists, but from a timeline perspective, so you have context. And you can look back on the previous shift or previous two shifts to see what they were dealing with, but also seeing what was happening currently. I wanted to bring up this visualization briefly. This is a uh, topology visualization. This is representative data from one of our accounts where it's representing a service infrastructure and there are thousands of nodes with thousands of connections. And with the new technologies that we're employing today, you can very quickly filter and zoom in on this to a degree that we were never able to before. And what this really does opens up a lot of possibilities for us in terms of the level of infrastructure that we can, we can visualize. And while there's pros and cons to that and its utility, it was something that people were always trying to achieve. Now we're at a point of technology where it can be done. I want to drill down again. I see a device there that I want to get more information on. Uh, just a couple of another couple of quick displays here. This is a KPI comparison visualization. Uh, it's really intended to, to show KPIs that you want to compare and you've got a lot of flexibility in there and into what can be presented. So this is just another way of taking that information that we're looking at and combining it to provide a you know, holistic perspective on an issue that we're trying to understand. Finally, I just wanted to quickly touch on security operations. This is another microfocus product. This is ArcSight that we're connecting to. And again, you know, this kind of information we're, we're seeing in the environments that we're working in today that there is a, it's slow, but there is progress in terms of security operations, network operations working together. And through our tool, we're able to, again, fuse that information, provide it in a meaningful context for presentation. And if you see here, we had a topology view that was being shown earlier. We have what's called a kiosk mode that lets you transition into was a map. And now what we're showing is a flow diagram of attackers from the source to the destination, the techniques that they're using. So again, this would be shown as a list, but we're showing it as a flow. What's also shown as a list down here in these events is also being shown as a topology and can also be shown as a geospatial map. So just wanted to give you some perspective on that. We're, we're, we're we're making, we have customers that are working with our product from the security perspective, from the IT operations perspective, and that's starting to blend together. It's a very interesting time for those things. Okay. I'm gonna go back to our original example. Let's try to cover a couple of quick things now, just getting into the details of how things work. And we'll turn it over for questions. When I opened up this view earlier, I opened up the, well, the incidents view. I'm gonna go through this view here really briefly. I'm gonna go into edit mode, and I'm gonna see how we configure one of these visualizations. This is what's called a list visualization. Uh, we have about a dozen different types of visualizations, and when I say a dozen, I mean that includes charts, which in itself is probably about another dozen or so, uh, op, you know, 
types of visualizations. Uh, and here, and this is this is what I was talking about before. You've got your you've got your editor that lets you make changes. I've got this in what's called a flow layout right now, which means the different icons and information that I've created flow from left to right. If I want to change that, I can change it to a vertical flow, vertical layout, which depending on the visualization perspective pushes everything into a vertical, but it's just a different way of presenting it. Go back to flow in this case. And here, what I'm doing is you see this data feed here is feeding data into the visualization. I've got an option of different things that I can pull into the visualization in terms of attributes. And when I select an attribute, I can then define what I want the renderer to be. Number renderers, text renderers, and icon renderers are all different as are date renderers. If I want to look at my icon renderer, I can see here that we have the ability to, to essentially build uh, custom icons, each of which, each component of which is, can be driven from a different status information. So we might have NMI showing up down status, or we might have, in this case, we might have a wrench showing maintenance status. We may have a device type we want to present and or performance. And in each case, each one of these things can be tied up to a, a data source. So, let me go back to another example and get into that in a little more detail. Back to a different perspective on NMI. Again, we have our geospatial display here. I go into my edit mode. Go into my icon builder here. And again, I've got the control. I can build a new icon if I'd like. So I've got this one I just created. I want to change it to be derived, which means I want to have it driven off of a data set. Maybe I want it to be an NMI severity icon. I'm using the status indicator to drive what icon it is. These rules here essentially allow you to set up conditions and or conditions or groupings of them to define what kind of icons you want presented for what specific data set. So here we're looking at an NMI security string, and we're defining what kind of token or what kind of an icon we would like to be applied to that. In the same sense, I can look at my severity colors. And I have the same capability. I can specify how I want the colors to be defined depending on the string. The reason why we segmented these is because the data set that drives the icon shape may be different from the data set that drives the icon color. And that's very true when we're looking at fusing some of this different sets of information together. But I can create these things and I can show you an example of it here of just, I've decided I want to change its orientation. So I can move it left, I can move it right, I can move it over to the side. I can change its offset, make it minus 50 in this case. Just position it oops, how I would like on the screen. So you've got full control to create these composite icons. And what's very powerful of that is that, you know, oftentimes somebody who's looking at these screens, they really want uh, to see specific information about a device or a service. And this lets you tailor what can be presented to them. So it's more meaningful visually and from a data perspective. Go back to my other screen here and just show you an example of how variables are incorporated into these different uh, flows and streams that we have. Let's look at the pipeline for this visualization here. And I want to just give you a quick view of how variables are employed in these uh, pipelines. This pipeline is connecting to the SOAP API. To get the visualization that we wanted, the information we need, we actually made three requests to the SOAP API. Generally speaking, uh, different APIs 
they sometimes you can get all the information in one on one request. Sometimes you need multiple requests, and this is the kind of flexibility we have in that we can make multiple requests and essentially fuse them together. Now, when we make a request for the nodes that are part of the node group that we're trying to present here, you'll see we have a variable in here called node group ID. So when the request is made, somebody clicks on a node group on one of the screens, that variable gets populated with the node group ID, the request is made back to the connection, and the data set then represents, you know, presents only the, the nodes with that group ID. So if we look at that in action, you, know, you see that you know, here's the data set that we have returned, a specific set of node group IDs, and then we tabularize it. We're using the node group as this is the node group that's being used to drive this data. And when that, just like on the page variables, when that action is clicked, it updates, the request is fired off, and then the corresponding pipeline is run. This is called a node variable, but we could easily replace it with what's called a secured variable. I'll just go ahead and show you an example of what that would be like. Secured variable is something that's assigned to a user or a group, but it never gets exposed to the end client. So if I want to restrict a specific customer or user to just seeing the nodes in that node group, I can make that filtering happen on the back end. It's never exposed to the front end, and that way the user can never modify a query or make some kind of a change to the URL to bypass the security model that we have. Last thing I wanted to cover is on the provisioning side of the product. The product has the concepts of what are called domains. These are really what you would consider to be groups in, in an LDAP or Active Directory sense. And for, for those groups, you have the ability to control what content is made visible to them. So this tree here that you're seeing is essentially the entire directory, both visible and hidden, that you're seeing in these menu items. And you can turn on or turn off different things that you would like them to be able to see or not. You don't want to give them security ops, but I don't want to give them server ops. You've got full control here. And when this user logs into the system or this group, they'll just see the content that's been provisioned for them. Users are assigned to a group. This is a very simple one. This is an admin for this default environment. And it's not unusual to have thousands of users in these, in these views. This is a secure variable. This is how we apply some of those credentials back to the backend system. Password policy control, preferences, look and feel, and then what's called kiosk mode. And this is a user that runs on the, it's, it's essentially a user that doesn't really interact with the browser, but it runs on the big screen continuously. So if you put something in kiosk mode, you have it on a large monitor, it'll just continue to move through the different pages and visualizations like a playlist over and over again. It's for that overall awareness and visibility. Again, the concept of domains, very similar, I'm sorry, roles, and then also of users. It's the same concept uh, in terms of what they can see, their, uh, their credentials and their <clears throat> secure variables. And finally, there's a series of defaults that we have. So put those all together, it's a, it's a fully capable provision model to provide secure access to specific parts of content to specific customers or roles within your organization. Last, last comment I wanted to make, and then we'll turn it over for questions, is the different hooks that we provide for developers into the product. And going into my edit mode here, what you're seeing here is an example of a, it's called an HTML template visualization. And this is, again, it's taking information from various sources, but essentially what it is, is it's a template for an HTML JavaScript application. You define what your HTML is, paste it in, define what your CSS is, you paste it in there or reference it externally, same thing with the HTML. And then you have your JavaScript, which again can either be referenced internally, uh, externally, or embedded here. And this is the uh, JavaScript that has hooks into our Angular infrastructure to pull data out of the pipeline just like any other visualization could, or perform actions. So, you know, we, we've got a lot of enablers in the product to make this process easy, low code, low-click environment, 
what we're really also doing is providing the underpinnings for development teams to build upon this feature function. You know, take advantage of our infrastructure and the work we put in place, and then build specific contents and views that are, you know, again, specific to their organizational customers. And then in a review perspective, we have it here. That those same developer hooks are available in our transformations. We have JavaScript transformations, we have JavaScript connectors, uh, we have scripting interfaces as well, uh, command line interfaces. So there's just a variety of different mechanisms that we have uh, to, to really provide access to the tool and the infrastructure that we have here today. So I want to thank you all for your time today. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn it over for questions. Thank you, Ed, for a great overview of Edge Suite um, and showing how a single pane of glass with actionable insight can enable NetOps, DevOps, and SecOps teams to achieve more. Um, do we have a list of questions for you from our audience? Uh, we'll try to cover them all. But if we don't get to cover uh, all the questions by the end of this webinar, um, Ed and his team can reach out to you directly after the event to provide some answers. Um, so for our first question, um, what are the average number of applications uh, your customers use in their portal? It, it varies depending on the size of the organization, but it's not unusual for there to be dozens of systems reflected and products uh, reflected in the portal. It's you know, the, the diversity of the applications that are being uh, deployed and, and also, I guess, integrated from an acquisition perspective with our larger organizations, it, it's just, uh, it's huge. And, and really, when we're talking about a single pane of glass for a large group of operators and their stakeholders, uh, the number of tools can be quite large. Awesome. Um, also, uh, another question. Uh, can your customers create their own HTML visual visualizations to use? Right, and I think that that kind of dovetails off the last thing that we covered on the presentation, which is we have a number of different hooks for developers to, to make their own visualizations, make their own connectors, make their own transforms, um, if, they, if that's the path that they decide to take. So we, we fully exposed the features of the product to that audience while maintaining the simplicity that we're, we're really trying to achieve in a lot of cases with making the process of unifying this information into a single pane of glass easier. Great. And um, another question, how does your multi-tenancy work? Multi-tenancy in the product really gets um, realized in, a couple, in, in several different ways, both at the way we do our provisioning, which I showed you a little bit earlier, how content is provisioned based on customer or domain, then how we're connecting to the different resources that we're connecting to, whether it be a REST API or a web in, in an application, we manage the credentials in a way that makes sure that you're accessing the right system uh, with the right credentials, or you know, we're deferring that to a, a secondary system like a CyberArk or something else along those lines that's gonna do our credential management for us. Um, and then finally, on the web integration side specifically, we've got a number of different mechanisms in place to restrict what parts of the product are, are, are essentially accessed, um, how they're accessed, and then mechanisms inside the pipeline that I showed you a little bit earlier that, that allow you to restrict data flow between your customer and the server uh, in a way that they can't they can't work with. And we've got a number of different, I'm sorry, they can't change. And we've got a lot of different um, security boundaries in place in the product relating to the SQL that we saw there earlier, uh, SQL injection protect, protection, and, and a number of different mechanisms. So that's how Great. we realize that. Um, awesome. Um, another question, uh, do you have failover capability? Yeah, we have a failover capability from both the endpoints that we're connecting to. So if we're connecting to NNMI or OMI, uh, we have a failover you know, strategy for NNMI server one fails, NNMI server two is then accessed. So at that, at that level, we have failover. We also have active failover uh, in two, two flavors for the product itself. One is a more traditional uh, model where you have individual instances of a product running behind a load balancer, and they're just managed individually. Uh, the other is a clustered model where 
all the servers are talking to or are behind a load balancer, but they're also sharing sessions via shared resource. And if one of them goes down, the user's experience is really still maintained. They don't have to re-log in or re-authenticate. They just get past the next server. So from a, I guess from a failover perspective, we really focus on those two aspects of it. Awesome. Um, and relating to security, I believe, um, can this do something like LDAP for logins? Can you repeat that, please? Uh, can this use something like LDAP for logins? Yeah, absolutely. So the the model for the users that I showed you a little bit earlier can be fully synchronized with an, act, an LDAP or Active Directory server. So the idea is that Edge Suite is put out on the network, somebody logs in, they try their account, they try their user account. Uh, when that user tries to connect, we validate it with LDAP that it actually exists, and now they become an active user in our product, and they're, they're given the access that they they're afforded through the LDAP system. So yes, absolutely. Not only LDAP, but other identity providers out there today, um, SAML, and I guess you mentioned CAC in the federal space. We're very flexible in that regard. Fantastic. Um, it's another question. Uh, we have to secure our data. Can this be installed in our data center? Yes, absolutely. I think you know, we're, when we're connecting to a data set or data in a data center, we're really only connecting to the information that we need for one thing. We're not acting as a centralized repository for all that information. So we're not a CMDB. We're making, we're making real-time requests to these systems as we need the information. Um, from a delivery perspective, we have a number of different mechanisms in place to both protect our back-end data sets that we're, we're connecting to uh, and also the web applications. And I mentioned some of those a little bit earlier. It's really, I mean, that, that service provider, managed service provider model is really been a, a focus of ours in the past and continues to be. And the, the model itself translates very well to the enterprise also in that enterprises are now operating more and more like service providers uh, to their own internal customers. So those same kinds of things uh, translate over quite well. Awesome. Um, I do see that we're past the hour, um, so I believe we could end our questions for today. Um, and like I said, Ed and his team can reach out to you directly for the remaining questions, uh, list of questions that we have here. Um, do we have any more slides to share? I think there should be something on upcoming webinars. Awesome. So um, thanks again for joining today's webinar, uh, and be sure to register for some upcoming webinars um, listed here. Um, let your colleagues and customers know as well, uh, and I hope you could join us in and, and, and these future webinars. And um, also, I believe there's a survey. Great. Um, so complete this short survey and opt in for more information from Edge. Um, you could find it at www.edgetechnologies.com or at visitworldwide.org. Thank you, everyone. Uh, appreciate your time and look forward to uh, joining again.